Determining the proper neck tension or case neck tension is something that I've heard a lot about, but have seen very little data that actually helps us reloaders understand what we really want to know. How to know what value is best for our application. Is there a universal value that is best? If we change it, how does it actually affect the performance of our reloads? This is what we're addressing in today's video. Reloaders tend to use a lot of words that don't necessarily mean anything to Webster, but yet they mean something to us. These can often mean different things to different people. Anytime we talk about something like neck tension, I think that we need to try and put a definition behind it. To start, Sammy's definition for neck tension is something like the circumferential stress that the case neck exerts on the seated projectile as a result of the interference fit provided by the case neck inside diameter and the projectile outside diameter. I'm not sure that's exactly how I would have picked to define it, but overall, I guess it's a good start. Possibly a more common definition might be the actual amount of force required to seat a projectile into or pull out of a case. You might use something like an arbor press with a force pack to monitor this value as you seat projectiles. Yet another way I've heard of defining this term is the difference between the projectile's diameter and the inside diameter of the neck after the sizing operation is complete. So if you're working with the 308 projectile and the inside case neck measures 306, you're using essentially two thousandths of neck tension. More often, I hear this term used by measuring a loaded round, picking a bushing that is X thousand smaller than that, and referring to that as the amount of neck tension. This definition very frequently does not account for any spring back the case might have, but it's a number, and it's pretty easy to understand. Yet another way of talking about this, and the way I will mostly refer to it today when it comes to our testing, is simply by using the dimension of the expander mandrel as it relates to the diameter of the projectile. For our testing today, we're using 308 Winchester, and we're using mandrels sized all the way from 305 thousandths all the way to 308 thousandths. Again, now accounting for brass springback. We are all very aware that this is a factor, but this will also, again, just make it easier to understand. When we're talking about neck tension today, we're simply referring to the expander mandrel size that we use to size the inside diameter of the case. Whenever possible, I try and keep things easy. To be clear, brass springback will change this value but I have no way of measuring exactly how much the spring back is. But you should have no trouble understanding it, so you could repeat it if you desire. Our definition section covered some of this information, but let's go over four different ways to set case neck tension. Option one, using a standard full length die. A standard full length die is going to oversize the neck of a case, so when the expander ball is pulled back through the neck of the case, the case neck tension is a function of the size of the expander ball used to resize the case neck. Standard full length dies work this way because case neck thickness can vary by manufacturer, lot, or probably other factors. By oversizing the neck of the case and then running the expander ball ensures that every different manufacturer's case and every single lot should at least function for any combination. Option two is still on our full length dies. Some manufacturers have a honing service. I know Forrester offers this service. You can actually have the neck portion of the die opened up to whatever diameter just as if you were using a bushing die. The downside of this is if you ended up wishing that you could change this diameter, what's well, one and done. Switching brands of brass, case neck wall thickness, or possibly even lot variation could cause an issue in your reloading process, but it is an option. Option three is probably the most common one I've seen discussed, and that is the use of a bushing in a bushing die. Redding's S die and many manufacturers have dies like this use bushing sold in one thousands increments to set this neck tension value. One of the negative things I see often overlooked for this type of method is any difference in case wall thickness variation can cause uneven pressure on varying sides of the projectile. Maybe this does or doesn't affect reloads, but it's something I consider. Switching brands of brass, possibly lot, might change the value of bushing that you need, so you might need more than one on hand. Bushings aren't an extreme cost when it comes to the entire reloading process, but they can run $17 a piece. And if you don't know what value you need out of the gate, you're probably going to end up getting a couple to test out which one works best. Option number four, and the one I've used the most to this point, is the use of expander mandrels. Expander mandrels allow you to use bushing dies, standard dies, and allow you to set the neck tension value based on the diameter of the expander mandrel. And all the ways that I've used to size brass, this has worked the best as far as concentricity values are concerned. Since the expander mandrels are available in half thousands increments, we should be able to fine tune the neck tension that works best for us. Other things that are gonna affect our neck tension value and are gonna vary by your process is the neck wall thickness of the cases you're using, the amount of bearing surface, so like caliber, the surface condition of the inside of the neck. Something like leaving the residual carbon can act as a lubricant. Overcleaning your brass might actually increase the value of your neck tension. The actual length of the neck of the case can affect your value. 
whether or not the projectiles have any type of coating, whether you're annealing your brass or it's been fired multiple times, even the duration of time between the projectile seeing process and the actual firing can affect this value. Sometimes you hear people refreshing the necks just to try and even out the neck tension on a lot of reloads. There are likely even more factors in this, but these are some general things to think about when you're talking about neck tension. So as reloaders, what do we actually care about neck tension? What does this setting do? Does it affect our velocity? Does it affect the repeatability of the statistics or the combustion of our reloads? And does it affect the accuracy? Does it open up our groups? All things we're going to talk about today. Various places on the internet are going to tell you what values they use, and I'm not saying it's bad information. In all the looking I've done, I found very little data that talked about how changing this value affected the performance of their reloads. One interesting source I found on Accurate Shooter was advice from the U.S. Army Markmanship Unit. In one of their postings where they were addressing frequently asked questions, how much neck tension is optimal and how should I select a neck bushing size? The U.S. Army Markmanship Unit offers a straightforward answer. They suggest that hand loaders start with a neck bushing that sizes the neck so that it is three thousandths less than the loaded outside diameter with the projectile in place. From there, you can experiment with more or less neck tension, but this is a good starting point for many popular cartridge types. Interesting to me because this varies from most of the people I've heard referring to two thousandths of neck tension. But let's let the test results speak for themselves. For today's testing, before anyone loses their mind, this one test is not going to be the end all test to show you what neck tension is the best and which one you should use. It is likely you should test this for yourself. Full disclosure, the load data used for today was originally worked up in different manufacturer brass. It was set up with two thousandths of neck tension and the results are actually 50 feet per second lower than I anticipated. But all that out of the way, we're still going to be able to see how the neck tension variation change affected our groups and the performance of our reloads. The original intent of this reload was to mimic the performance of this 308 Winchester gold medal match ammunition from Federal. This ammunition has performed very well for me and I think it's a great baseline to discuss. The projectile for today's test is the same one that's used in the gold medal match ammunition. Sierra's 175 grain match king, part number 2275. The brass we're using is Lapo, once fired large rifle primer brass. This brass was annealed, re full length resized with a 2000s bump, and trimmed to a consistent length of 2.005 inches. The primer we're using for today's test is the Fed 210M. The power we're using is IMR 8208XBR at a charge weight of 40.8 grains. For the neck tension variable of today's testing, we're using the 21st century expander mandrels, starting out a dimension of 305 thousandths, going up in half thousandths increments, all the way to the projectile diameter of 308 thousandths. The coach's overall length that we'll be using today is 2.802 inches, which is a ballpark CBTO of 2.215 inches. If you're interested, I'll put a link to the expander mandrel video in the description box below if you want to understand better how these things work and their uses. Before we look at the groups, let's talk about velocity. Did the neck tension values of today's testing affect the velocity of our reloads? One thing of note is that I forgot to bring a fouling round before we ran today's testing, so I did omit the first data point from the 305 group, so it did not throw off the numbers of the rest of the data. For today's testing, we fired 49 rounds, seven different groups, seven shots each. The only piece of data we omitted was the velocity data from the first round. Looking at our velocity chart, we can see our velocity remained extremely consistent from 305 thousandths all the way to 306 and a half. The average velocity of these rounds did not vary more than two feet per second. Using the 307 thousandths mandrel, our value jumped up around 15 feet per second, but comes back down with only a slight increase in velocity, bringing our average velocity value up just a little over five feet per second. Certainly not what I expected, but that's why we test these things. I found it very interesting that changing the neck tension value earlier on in our chart affected the velocity so little. So what about groups, right? Groups varied a lot more than I expected, so let's just go through the numbers. Starting with our 305 expander, we can see our seven shot group performed at 1.516 MOA. With the 305.5 expander, our group improved to 1.004 MOA. Using our 306 expander, and this was the value this load was developed at, a seven shot group yielded a 0.885 MOA group. Using our 306.5 expander, our group opened up to 1.261 MOA. At 307, it was 1.235 MOA. At 307.5, our group was 1.229 MOA. And using a neck tension that I probably wouldn't recommend, our groups actually shrank back down to 0.874 MOA. Now that you've seen all these groups, let's look to see how the statistics actually changed based on the neck tension. Again, omitting the first round data, our 305 expander mandrel yielded an average velocity of 2501, extreme spread of 31, and a standard deviation of 12.9. 
Moving on to 3055, average velocity of 2500 feet per second, extreme spread of 32, standard deviation of 11.9. Moving on to our 306, 2499 feet per second was our average, standard deviation dropped to 18 with a standard deviation of 5.6. The 3065 expander manual, we had an average velocity of 2501, extreme spread opened up a little to 23, standard deviation of 8.1. Moving on to 307, 2516 was our average velocity, extreme spread of 26, standard deviation of 8.6. Using our 3075 expander, our average velocity dropped back to 2508, extreme spread jumped to 35, with standard deviation of 11.5. Moving on to 308, average velocity dropped again slightly to 2506, the extreme spread dropped to 27, standard deviation of 9.9. .9. So just to be clear, this load was developed using the 306 expander mandrel setting our neck tension. I do not know how much that would affect our results today, but in my opinion, it's very clear if we look at our chart, looking at everything all at once, our group size was the smallest, our statistics were the best with two thousandths of neck tension. This is not the only test where I've ran where I've found that two thousandths of neck tension seem to be what's performed best for me. Just because this worked best for me doesn't mean it's going to work best for you. And this is where I'm very interested in listening to the community here. I have tested it, but I want to know what you guys have tested. I would love to hear your experience in the comment section below. What neck tension values are you running? Are you using bushings, expander mandrels? What differences are you seeing when you run this type of testing? I'd really like to dig into this even further on the channel if people are interested in it. So if you're looking for more of that content, make sure you subscribe. If you'd like to learn more about these 21st century expander mandrels, I'll put a card up so you can check them out. If not that, YouTube thinks there's another video here that you're going to enjoy. Like, subscribe, and all that fun stuff. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you come back next week. And until then, stay safe in small groups.